Welcome to Die Hard on a Blank, the podcast where we explore the influence of Die Hard on action cinema, one action movie at a time. I'm Philip Gawthorne, and with me as always is Liam Billingham, and today's film is Executive Decision. It's Die Hard on a plane again. On a plane again. But a much bigger plane than Passenger 57. Uh, is it a much bigger plane? Significantly. Yeah, I guess you're right, because that's like a, that's like, this one's that an was why that moved. That's why they had to go to the fairground where in the middle of the film, because there was nowhere left to go. Where does this film, this plane take off from? Athens. Athens, right, Greece. Right, Athens, Greece. Right, not Georgia. Athens, Greece, and it's flying to Washington, D.C. Yes. Huh. Hmm. And then hmm. those pesky terrorists <laughs> as they always do. get involved, as they tend to do in action oh, cinema. Oh, my goodness. Did you see this uh, when it came out? I saw it on home video, watched it a lot. Uh, think it's, um, you know... An interesting movie that sort of helped started that along with On Deadly Ground kind of ended the love affair with Steven Seagal. Um, it's interesting that, you know, your dad, as we've discussed, was a man of impeccable taste. And yet... Loved Seagal. Loved Seagal. Uh, well, or I loved mean, Under Siege. to be fair, yeah. He wasn't and, like and then, sitting around then, being like, let's watch Mark for Death on a yeah. Tuesday night. He liked <laughs> Under Siege. I think he thought Under Siege 2 was pretty bad. Has anyone seen Richie? Sorry, that's the my out, that's for the out for justice heads. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, on Deadly Ground, I remember him being like, oh, that was a piece of shit. So, <laughs> yeah. And I think he... I think recall him liking this movie... Um, he actually he actually had a really interesting perspective on on a racial component of this movie that I'll cover later. Yeah, um, but I have a distinct memory of us watching this together and him saying something about the ending of this movie. He was like, "Wow, I can't believe this is this is a the ending of this movie surprised him." Huh? Yeah, well, we'll get there. Yeah, sorry to get heavy to all of a sudden. No, no, no. I I, I want to hear. What that. about you? I saw this with my mom and dad at the jump at off the, the, at the cinema. Yeah, my dad didn't shout jump uh, off. That's uh, too bad. Uh, Previously, uh, this week. I, think on a blank. I think he quite enjoyed. Oh, this we is a dad core. This movie is And my mom liked this film, yeah. too, even though David Strathairn isn't in it, which mm. is... Uh, <laughs> no, but she gets David Suchet, that, <laughs> heart, yes. that heartbreaker. Yeah, there's a bunch of other hunks uh, <laughs> David Suchet. <laughs> involved. And Andreas Katsoulis, all the hunks <laughs> yeah. are in this movie. Uh, no, this was in the Halcyon days where my... I was still, you know, I, I wasn't quite in my full teenage somewhat very mild rebellion yeah so i was still going to see the going to see movies I with saw my mom and dad with my dad through high school um, i just i didn't you know we still did it i actually got sad when i started to go to movies without him because i was like oh i grew up i think to be fair i was probably still was going to the movies a lot because my mom and dad were cinephiles so yeah. we, we would go a lot we'd go to the cinema and you know and go to your deep pan pizza and have mm, all of those happy oh days God. we used to do on a sunday deep pan pizza um, so this was one of those movies and we watched it we enjoyed it I, i've maybe seen it once uh, on tv over the years it was not one that i owned but i did buy a sort of sometimes this is and this is a good like life hack for any of yeah. you um for people that want to keep up with the show but you can often get a good deal getting like a kurt russell action collection kind oh, of like yeah old dvd we get like four movies you get like this um, escape from la or yeah there's a whole or or you know th there's often a bunch of good deals you can find from certain um distributors but i i hadn't seen it since for a long a I really think long I time had like a vhs taped off tv version of this or like maybe it's too late for that it's a real good sunday afternoon movie I yeah think. totally you know, i've it, revisited it, has, it a lot it's not i wouldn't call this like a friday night movie it, it actually feels like a sunday afternoon well i think movie. it's a hangover movie you know? too you yeah. know like it's definitely like okay it's on tnt it's one one totally. one p.m uh, I'm going to watch this whole thing. And you've just missed the first 10 minutes, but you're like, oh, you know. Yeah, who th cares? Th this yeah, bit's yeah, coming yeah. up. I And I have to say, I, so I haven't watched it in a long time, and I thoroughly enjoyed this. Oh, yeah. I really, really enjoyed it. I thought it was excellent. I it's, really, really liked it. One or two issues, but for the most part, like, I thought this was like, a, a pretty close to a bullseye it, for a it genre. It exudes a real a high level of intelligence for this genre. I listened to someone talk about it recently, and they said it was dumb, and I was like, it's like it's dumb and again it's like silly in the way that all the, the, these movies are silly but like it's pretty banger like it really it's a really really good movie and actually i've had a few people when i've told them about the concept of the show be like are you going to cover executive there's decision big fans so it's a bit of, of a it. sleeper yeah, hit. well it covers a lot of grounds a lot of basis it's kind of almost the quintessential David 90s has. uh <laughs> die hard on a blank movie totally you know it's one of the better die hard on a blank style films. yeah i would More, say it's like know. at the top tier of the second yes. the top of the second tier like a, a, an a minus or b plus yeah of, it's a you know. 
the best way, it's yeah. a B plus. But yeah, yeah, the David Suchet heads, the Andreas Katsoulis heads. All those guys. All they're those all, guys, they're all know, in our business. We want the- very <laughs> ethnic looking dudes who are not ethnic. Let's talk about them. <laughs> Uh, can we get some fast facts? Actually, Andreas is ethnic. Let's, let's, let's get some fast facts going about the film. Yeah. Executive decision. So it was released by Warner Brothers in the US on March 15th, 1996, which is approximately one month after our last film and slightly similarly themed uh, Broken Arrow. Um, it was directed by Stuart Baird from a screenplay by Jim Thomas and John Thomas, uh, who also produced along with Joel Silver. It stars it's a lot of royalty in the yeah, names you just action read. Action movie royalty. It stars speaking of speaking of, it stars Kurt Russell, Woo! Halle Berry, John Leguizamo, David Suchet, Oliver Platt, B. D. Wong, Whip Hubley, and Steven Seagal. And on an estimated budget of fifty million, it grossed a hundred and fifteen million. So more than one, double one, five. one one oh. five, which which actually less than Broken Arrow. Mm. Um Well, I would say for broken, a film that yeah. feels bigger somehow. Uh, to me, in a way, even though a lot of this is contained, yeah, um, I don't know. It feels like Broken Arrow. I'm not saying Broken Arrow is a small film by any, no. by any stretch, but it almost. I don't know, well, maybe Broken the size has of the, the cast. cast of a play. It's so small. Like there's like 10 people. Right. In this has Arrow. a huge cast, yeah. you know, and a lot of pretty big stars. Yeah. You know, so, um, you know, it, interesting. It was a hit, you know, it was yeah. a good, solid hit. Um, there's also quite a lot of that hard DNA. You, are, 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 is your head about to come off on your Arnold Schwarzenegger underneath? Because it sounded like you were having a bit of a. <laughs> what are we? What section are we doing now? Die hard DNA. Catch. Oh, my God. <laughs> Liam's just thrown me his head and he's a totally different person underneath. Oh, my. It's Andreas um, Katsoulis. <laughs> I think that's um, the extended joke of the episode is just saying these that These in-jokes are getting more and more esoteric, oh, well, and I'm all here for it. Welcome to the fucking podcast. So in terms of diehard DNA, we've got um, a lot of personnel. Producer Joel Silver being the, the main one, of course. Um, the director, Stuart Baird, of, you know. Wow editor par excellence uh, throughout the uh, 90s was was an editor on Die Hard 2. Um, he, of course, he direct. this was his directorial debut. Woo! Um, what a movie to kick it off with. Yeah, Good and he'd go him. on to make, uh, he'd go on to direct two more two more movies and then return to the editing chair. We made made this and U.S. Marshals. Um, and and, uh, and he a made Star, Star, uh, Star, Star Trek, Trek sequel. Nemesis. Yeah, yeah, yeah Star yeah. Trek sequel, yeah. You know um, who's in that movie? Tom Hardy. Yeah, as the villain, right? Mm-hmm. We're, and if you're into Star Trek, we're going to have uh, maybe have a little treat for you little coming down the road. Down Hang in there for that. That's right. Tom Hardy's coming on our Star Trek yeah. Nemesis episode. <laughs> to tell us all about So, Tom, role. tell me a little bit about your work in that film. It doesn't matter <laughs> who I am. What matters is my plan. Sorry. So, if anyone had uh, 11 well. minutes before Liam's Dark Knight Rise this reference, <laughs> take it off your bingo that card. That was actually only eight. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, the editor of this film, Frank J. Urosti, <laughs> was uh, an editor on Die Hard, of course. And we also get a brief and welcome appearance from Mary Allen Trainer. Oh, yeah. Um, who plays, uh, of course, Gail Wallins in Die Hard and its spin off, Ricochet. Rick- it's Die Hard in the ECU. And uh, plays the uh, flight attendant who it's meets his sad. unfortunate, um, fairly that early demise. That tough. Yeah, she just gets her head didn't really broken get to, in. Didn't really get to know her or understand her relationship I, with Halle Berry. I also just want to say that Mary Ellen Trainer is in my favorite action franchise of all time, Lethal Weapon. So ten minutes for Lethal Weapon. Oh, Tick that off. Your, your uh, mm. get get your stamp. Get your Die Hard and a blank oh, stamp. God, <laughs> um, Do you really want to jump? <laughs> Um, so this is a classic Die Hard on a Blank scenario. Of course, in addition to the personnel, the actual premise, it's it's bad guys taking over a blank, an ordinary guy being forced to fight back, cat and mouse interplay in confined spaces. It's actually a fusion of Die Hard and Jack Ryan in yes, a lot of ways. very much so. Um, in terms of like Die Hard beats, you've got the, the exact number of terrorists being identified for strategic mm. reasons. 
Um, the ending and final shot is almost identical to both Die Hard and Die Hard 2. Uh, this is like a Joel Silver thing, I think, because yeah. Demolition Man also ends similarly. Mm. But this is basically almost like almost the same framing, I think, as Die Hard 2. You're right. And in, in which of course also ends on the on the runway. Um, and in this instance, there's another Die Hard connection because the song playing is It's Nice to Go Traveling, sung by Frank Sinatra, who was, of course, the star of The Detective, the previous Roderick Thorpe adaptation that preceded Die Hard. It's kind of interesting how these movies have these, like, very orchestral, heavy scores, and they almost all end with, like, absolutely, like, well, but that vibe like, like to is so the, Die Hard. Yeah, you're right. You know? it absolutely like, it, it's, it's a crooner. It's the yeah. old crooner. It's, yeah. And it makes it timeless right. uh, to some extent, even though this it's is too a bad very they 90s they can't, film. Bruno didn't do any of the scores. Yeah, the but, the harmonica out you know Aww. return of bruno bruce um we love you bruce we, uh so what makes this different though I, I, and i think this is the, the selling point of the movie i was just talking about this with my dad this morning you know but what what do you remember about it and it's, it's like it's the idea that the counter assault team are transferred onto the hijacked plane yes. while it's in mid-air in a pretty thrilling sequence fantastic yeah. You know, absolutely fantastic. I think that was something that was unique. We'd never seen that before. Uh, A phenomenal idea. Uh, But we're going to explore all that good stuff in a little more detail when we dive into anatomy of an action movie after this very quick break. And we're back with uh, anatomy of an action movie where we explore the tenets... We live in a twilight world. I don't know, friends at dusk of the... We're moving on. We're not, we're not getting bogged down in the tenet yeah, of quicksand yeah, this week. Um, <laughs> the, the premise of this movie is as follows, and it's a little bit... Uh, it's a bit chunky. When fanatical terrorists take control of a 747 passenger plane heading from Athens to Washington, D.C., U.S. Army intelligence consultant Dr. David Grant, played by Kurt Russell, Woo! informs the Pentagon of his suspicion that the terrorists are planning to use a stolen nerve agent known as DZ-5 to launch a massive attack on the eastern seaboard. If Grant is correct, this means the government may have to shoot the plane down before it reaches U.S. airspace. So in a last-ditch attempt to avoid this scenario and save the lives of the 400 passengers on board, Grant reluctantly becomes part of a daring mission led by Special Forces Lieutenant Colonel Austin Travis, Steven Seagal, whereby a small strike team will use an experimental aircraft to board the 747 in midair and attempt to take back control of the hijacked plane. And the ticking clock is, can Grant and the team take out the terrorists and disarm the massive booby-trapped nerve gas bomb on board before the 747 reaches U.S. airspace and the military are forced to destroy it? And I think I just realized that I forgot to say Joe Morton up front. Oh, How yeah. dare I? Yeah. The incredible, in incredible. third great performance in, his, in an action movie oh, in the 90s, at least. Kid. You know what just occurred to me and you were reading that because we just did an episode on Broken Arrow is like stealth fighters were all the rage in the mid 90s. Yeah, yeah. That's sort you of know? why, you know, this and Broken Arrow were kind of. Yeah, know, they have the kind of like, look at the stealth plane. Like, yeah. again, kind of like a fetishization, a fetishization kind of thing. That, like, of, uh, of which like US ugh, military gross hardware. a little bit, but like it's, it's also it's, exciting in the context of movies made for 14 year old boys I couldn't have said it better myself um yeah, it, it, you know, it's funny. I, I just had a weird flashback about that. The there time was, you um, flew that stealth bomber. Yeah. There was a magazine. Do you remember you know, those magazines? I don't know if you had them here, but they would be magazines where it was like, you, the first one is like a pound, but then they ma- make a collection. Yeah, 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 sure. And they had one of those and it was like the stealth, it was like stealth bomber. on the. It was like, pl- I, I was yeah. really into planes when I was a kid. Yeah. You know, and I, I Not loved helicopters? like- And helicopters yeah. and, you know, and cars and all those kinds. Yeah. And I'd read loads of books about them and like all the specs and everything. Yeah. And I remember, I remember this being like a thing, and it was like the stealth bomber was on the on the cover of this magazine, and uh, and behind a sunset. Boy, they start them young, and, don't they? Well, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And then you look back at now, and I'm like, this is repellent. Yeah, it's gross. It may as well be like a nuclear bomb yeah. on the cover of a magazine. Like, collect everything you need to know about well, nuclear holocaust. It's like it's disgusting. I'll morally. give you another example of that when I was a <laughs> kid. Know. 
I, there was like a guns and ammo magazine at the grocery store. And I was like, that's cool. Cause I watched like action movies. And my mom was like, you're not fucking by you. My kidding? mom was the same way. Yeah, No yeah, way. She was like, my, she's my like, mom was horrified by that. Shit, yep. You know, well, like it was nice to have the healthy line between the Absolutely, fictional movie. Yeah. Like, and, and, good and to have as a kid, I could like make that. the distinction to some extent, you know, yeah. but it, it is, you know, th these films do kind of walk in. Well, it's also tougher now because there's regard. more verisimilitude in the world with this kind of stuff. And like, you know, anyway, side yeah, note, yeah. but yeah, no, I think it's interesting to reflect on like you know we were kind of like teenage boys with toys and but at least this in, in this movie it's not some it's not about destruction no it, it, it's it's about saving lives against the government being being in a in this tactical situation where they have to make make this terrible sort of i don't know if hobbesian choice is the right term Ooh, but, look at you getting um, a hobbes reference in early you know, i love it that, that idea of yeah. the calculus of well we have to sacrifice 400 uh, yeah. lives, uh, American lives or whatever. I hate that term, by the way. That's always in these movies. American lives. Yeah, well, like that's more, that they have more value than any other yeah, life. Well, but you know what I mean? That's the language of yeah, these those movies. Those poor fucking British people in um, Die Hard 2 just all eat shit. <laughs> <laughs> Wins a flight one more one. It's awful. It's awful to watch that. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're only Brits, so, you know. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. They're more than We're just Brit. like British Rail Love. <laughs> we may take our time, but we get there in the end. Oh my God. Um. So, yeah, I, I think it, it's a great in conclusion, this is a great premise. Yeah. Great, great concept. That idea of the, the executive decision, the clue is in the title of, are they going to have to destroy the plane to for the for the quote unquote greater good, uh, and what is their sort of hail mary? And they literally call it that, don't they? Like yeah. The hail mary attempt is this uh, th this experimental craft created by uh, uh, the scientists from uh, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. I kind of forgot Agency. that, but yes, co totally. Um, amazing performance by the incredible Oliver Platt, who's just a, whenever he turns up, you're just like, you know, what's a good movie nobody talks about? The Three Musketeers. I never, with Keith I never saw it. I never saw it. Yeah, it's like a classic. He was, and he was one of the. Yeah, wasn't he was one, one of the he gang. Was Aramis, Aramis, yeah. I think. But I like that movie because it was sort of classic. It Disney makes a movie that's PG PG thirteen. So like, there's like like there's a scene in that movie when Tim Curry marries Rebecca De Mornay and is like basically forcing himself on. It's like the ending of Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, but it's like again, it's like kind of like. It's sort of is somewhere between like a Douglas Fairbanks or like classic swashbuckler film and like a modern Disney kitty thing, but like enough that like rewatching it. My sisters and I were talking about it recently. Like you rewatch some of the movies from the eighties and nineties, and you're like horrified at some of the stuff that people say or doing them. But also they had actual conflict and drama and didn't feel like kind of nostalgic like they are now. Anyways, great movie. Oliver Platt is phenomenal i mean he's, he's always so just funny. like yeah like a th when he shows up he, it, it's thrilling and i think his character is interesting because on paper he's at the beginning quite cowardly yeah. like you know but you never dislike him at all no you know well, he's kind of the every man in the hands of another yeah. actor that's less charming and appealing mm -hmm. that character could be like the 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 gutless, nerdy, or a Bob Gunton like yeah, character ugh. we just talked about in Broken Arrow. No who's offense, like in, Bob. In, in, we love him, but he's like that, that, yeah. that the the you know the asshole character, right? Um, that's that's like afraid and wants to surrender to the terrorist straight away uh, and make a deal. And and and, and the alpha the alpha dogs have right, to be like, right. you, shut up, you geeky bitch. Yeah, <laughs> Steven Seagal's here. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Well, like, there's a there's an interesting. You don't dislike him. It's logical that someone would voice that opinion. Yeah. and Oliver Platt is just so great that it, it totally works and you're with him. And he's, he, he's for, it's also that trope of hit of the every man and, and, and Kurt Russell's an every man too. And we're going to talk about him in a second, but he's Kurt being, Russell being forced into you know, that situation. That's the one thing that makes it tricky is that he's Kurt Russell. So it's like, yeah, you're an every man, but you're also a fucking Kurt Russell, like right. a golden God. And Oliver <laughs> Platt looks like me. You know what I mean? Like that's one of the things that's so, like there are different types of every man. Well, There's put the, a pair of glasses on Kurt Russell and oh you know. Oh my God, it, it, what a handsome Let's devil. get into it. Let's, Let's get into our hero it. section. Kurt Russell as Dr. David Grant. It's truly remarkable. And I, I stand to be corrected here, but I, I, I checked and incredibly for someone we talk about so much on this yeah. show as like a tangential uh, presence. This is actually the first Kurt Russell film we've covered. Favorite Kurt Russell performance, go. Escape from New York. <gasps> Very good. Uh, I'm going to say it. <clears throat> no, I have a, I have oh, a second. Okay. I have a second. Okay. No, you go first. Dark Blue. Oh he yeah, should he's have really won an good. Oscar he's really good. Movie. Yeah, they won't ever. That movie will never get you taken know. seriously. Unfortunately, he's very good in that movie. I'm going to say because I love it so much. Big Trouble in Little China. Yeah, I'm obsessed with Big Trouble in Little China. Also, Backdraft. 
I mean, you, is a you gr- could just go through his whole, yeah. like the, I'm sure probably 200 movies he's made since he was a Disney kid, yeah. you know. He's also um, the best thing about that Marvel, the Marvel movie, the Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Like rewatching him, like Kurt Russell, great yeah. in this movie. Like the dad thing, he's dad cool. He's never not, not no, he's, he's like great. Jeff Bridges. Like right. he's never not been exceptional. Yeah. You know, just one of those guys, no matter what genre it is. Tombstone. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah, like forget about it. Like forget, and that, that's what I think it. Uh, forget about forget it. Forget about that, it. I think that's what's interesting Joey about Triviani. this. Joey <laughs> just, 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 Triviani. You know what I was watching? What was it? I was watching um Tequila Sunrise last night and and there's this the, Matt LeBlanc's hot dog commercial. Do you remember? Oh, oh, oh my oh, the, god. The, 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 was it the ketchup? It's been so yeah, was, I know you're it was doing. in it. Was in it. You oh know where god. he like the, the the ketchup comes off the building and he like no thanks i've got it covered and his voice is dubbed wow so that was just a weird like thing That's that you said so funny joey tribbiani the the i think what's interesting about kurt russell in this part is that it does uh kind of straddle the it's a good part for him because it straddles the line between kurt as dramatic actor and action hero you know because he's playing a in ostensibly a Jack Ryan type intellectual, right. non-combatant. He's very believable right? in very that role. Believable. Yeah, he he conveys intelligence. Right, he can do the the like Alec Baldwin in the in Hunt for Red October type yeah. character. Right, no, he totally does, and like a kind of intellectual hesitance. And and but he's also somewhat uh you know he he has the jock thing covered to some extent because he's also like taking flying lessons well, he's also and big. you know he's a big and, dude. Uh, I also love the moment when the guy comes by with the martinis. Also, when I was watching this, I was like, oh, it would be nice to have a martini right now. And he picks them up and immediately walks over to the woman. He's like, I have baseball tickets. Uh, you know, I was going to say that that was his child blind. Like, uh, uh, do you like hockey? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, I'm it's like, so what good. a great movie. When I was single, I wish I'd, I wish I'd known that. that yeah. was, <laughs> do you like hockey? Yeah, it's so good. It's so, so good. <laughs> it's hard to say no to LA Kings tickets. Yeah, like, I bet. <laughs> yeah. I bet. No, he, 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 he's a little bit of a bond. He has a little yeah. bit of a James Bond well, quality they even in play this. with that. He's in the tux and they're like, yeah. who's this? 007 oh, is right. what yeah, Meg yeah. says to him. And then they put him in that sweatshirt and it's like when he's when he's walking through the plane with Halle Berry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's great. He's I mean, so, so great. He, he really anchors this movie. But of course, when the movie came out, it was marketed and framed as a two-hander with Kurt Russell and Steven Seagal. And they were, it wasn't, I'm saying and Steven Seagal, but in the poster, it didn't say and Steven Seagal. It was a, it's Kurt Russell, Steven Seagal, Executive decision. Is the rumor true that they rewrote it and killed him early because it was so miserable to have him on set? This I, is what I've heard. So I haven't heard. I didn't hear that. I think that was this was always the plan. Okay, but there was probably an element of <laughs> Warner Brothers might have just been sick of him, and yeah. they were probably trapped in some like multi-picture deal with him, right? Because they had the Under Siege sequels and On Deadly Ground, which was an absolute, which he directed, which was an absolute catastrophe. It's a bad movie, too. Really, it's really, really it's, it's bad. Appalling. Have you seen it? Oh, yeah, it's on. I couldn't get through it's it. It's bad. I had to turn it off, despite the presence of like Michael. Caine yeah, and, and like, I thought it might be fun. You yeah. know, at least like a bad, bad movie, fun level and I, it's like this no, no it's, it's unwatchable it's, it's pretty unwatchable it's not like a movie it it's it's like footage that was captured by yeah. a camera that Warner Brothers were forced into releasing and it costs like 50 it's million it's fucking though. garbage it's bad hey it's, tell you what you really think it's really it's terrible so I have so- a theory about <laughs> this movie in the annals of action movie history which is the fact that the movie's sort of first what is it, 30, 40 minutes or this kind of like battle of wills between the commando shithead mm-hmm. right. and the analyst, you very rarely get both in the same movie in the prominent roles, right? Yes. So in the case, like there isn't really, in Broken Arrow, which is the movie we just covered, I would say Christian Slater's a little smarter than the average, like, you know, he's using his wits to, he realizes the rope of dope in the movie. Like he's kind of right. smart and Whaley's kind of in the background. They have like maybe one or two lines together, you know, but like very rarely are the kind of like thinking man and the commando duking it out. Yeah. That's and the true. fact that the decision is made to kill off the commando makes you think a little bit about like, where are action heroes headed? Absolutely. In the, in the you know the mid nineties, are we going to move more towards these thinking man action the, heroes? The, 
I hate this. I hate this reduc- this reductive terminology, but it's a little bit alpha versus beta male. Yeah. Right. Like and or, or you know the brawn versus brain, which is all the post die hard effect. Right. We, we're no. We're beyond the days of the muscle bound. Yeah. Grotesques, and they literally kill him in this Bob movie. In yeah. Demolition Man, and and it's very symbolically significant. I think you're absolutely right that they say that he is killed off, and it also is like the death of Steven Seagal's kind of studio career. Yeah, it's to the so, end of to it. St- to, to some, some extent. To some he says, extent. Like, fire down below. There's and a, a couple other of things. like lingering Glimmer turds, Man. Man you know, that, this that are still stinking around, right. like fire down below. And then there's one other, there's one other one. Uh, that he, oh, but, uh, the, the Glimmer Man. Right. Uh, like, which the, is like kind of bottom. And not, I mean, not, it's not, it, yeah, it's just, it, Seagal starts to become a little poisonous. Yes. Yeah, beyond like the fact that nobody, you know, likes I, him When as the a movies stop becoming like really profitable, you know, eventually, I mean, that's how Hollywood, I think, kind of works. Like, it's like, we'll tolerate it if you're, st- if you're making shit loads of money right. up to a point. And the right. second you fall off, it's like, get rid of it. Well, and his Life's reputation was short. so bad. And, and by the by, on that point, I actually saw, and this is quite famous in the lore of this movie, but um, I saw the John Leguizamo one-man show, Ghetto Clown, mm-hmm. in uh, in London. And uh, he... It's, it was an amazing show and he played, you know, he's doing all of these people that he's worked with like Pacino and he'll turn into them and, you know, what a um, brilliant, it, 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 actor. brilliant, yeah. brilliant stuff. And also his life and his ethnicity and his cultural background and his ups and downs and his family. It was just, it was very mm. raw and honest and, and brilliant. Bit of a Bogosian, John Leguizamo. Yes, not very to, much not so. to diminish John Leguizamo, but like kind of a Renaissance man who I would think of along with like, a, worked, like a writer. He's worked and, for so long with yeah. so many great people and can hold, you know, one of you the can kings hold of the Spike, screen. some of Spike Lee's movies, you yeah. know? Yeah. If you can hold the screen with Al Pacino and as a young actor, yeah. you know, like, so, and he absolutely put the boot in on Seagal of what, what a bully well, he was, yeah. you know, how he like would pinned him at, get, you know, by the throat against a wall or all, that, all kinds of awful things. Did you see things. the menu? No. So apparently he plays a washed out action star in that movie. And the, uh, for what I've heard is that he based, uh, <laughs> okay. Unclear and Present Danger Pod brought this up, that he oh. based the character on Seagal. This yeah. kind of like shitty post-career action hero guy that like nobody, nobody really likes. But to come back to it, you know, it's interesting. Who are the iconic action movie characters after this movie? It's Ethan Hunt in Mission Impossible. Yes. Kind of brain meets brawn. Born, who I think in some ways is like the action, like, I mean, Matt Damon whips ass in those movies, but Matt Damon, like, Matt Damon became famous playing the smartest guy right. in the room. Right. Right. Like, you just, you don't, you don't really get the muscle bound dudes in the mainstream. You know, there's like, you know, there's exceptions to that, but like, this is also the, not the beginning of, but pretty soon the kind of like more bone crushing action movies are going to move towards DTV and becoming yes. a, like a little more of like a boutique kind of interest, but like, Seagal's death in this movie is kind of like the rejection of the simple muscle bound hero. Uh, absolutely. Um, and it, yeah, it, and it all traces back to that like paradigm shift um, from Die Hard. And I think yeah. now audiences now wanted uh, a, a combination, I think, which, which McLean kind of embodies of in, intelligence and physicality, yeah. but like a an everyman physicality. Well, I say this every episode, but again, with enough you know, enough weapons to arbor or orbit right. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like that's a really important line in action movie history. We're also going to get like, you know, we're going to get Stanley Goodspeed in the rock. Uh, yeah. Soon, I was, I was going to reference like, him. Yeah. The guy who, the kind of beta male, who, Super to nerd, use the term, a beta you know? male who becomes an alpha, alpha yeah. male and just starts like, that's his journey in, in, God. in the movie. We're, we're, I we're, take pleasure we're, in gutting you. <laughs> we'll get boy. there. Hoster that sidearm captain. Oh God. Shall we, this, this, now this is tricky turf um to quote the uh, obscure james bader 80s movie it's tough turf to discuss the villain of this piece uh, which is uh, a character called uh naji hassan naji. slash naji yeah naji hassan, hassan slash altar El- uh the yeah. the co-chief of the extreme the unnamed extremist organization who's played by uh david suchet as uh, David Suchet is is yeah. he's literally knighted, I believe, in uh, in the UK, he's Sir David Suchet. What does he mean to you as as um, as uh, an American? Poirot in this, and I didn't even really watch that Poirot's, but like, I think that this movie is a relic of a certain type of casting. That you know, again, it's like I, Suchet is a British Jew. He is not 
in any way uh, Arab or Middle Eastern or anything, and he looks vaguely ethnic in the same way that Andreas Katsoulis looks vaguely ethnic. And the way that some of these guys are kind of like, yeah, like look at like one only one of the guys I think in the movie is actually of Middle Eastern descent. I think the and, and Andre, Andreas Kuselis is Greek from like Chicago or from America. I, I think. think that's right. David Chusey is a British Jew. Um, I mean, it's just kind of racist. I don't know what else to say. Like, it doesn't. Not that you necessarily are like, man. I really want to know the motives of these terrorists, but it doesn't even do that thing that comes later, where like, you know, they make any of the characters sympathetic. David Suchet is excellent in this movie. I agree. He's like a simmer until he becomes a boil and then he's fucking crazy. And that's really good, but like the characters are so that the, they're so caricatured and the the only thing they have going for them is that good actors play the parts. But it's like I don't know. The the precursor to talking about David Suchet's performance in this movie in my opinion is like this movie is antiquated in, in the way it portrays uh you know, it's characters, it's Arab characters. It's not even, it's almost unclear even how to define them because it's so generic. Yes, they're, it's all vague. Their motivations are, like un, true are lies. Un, unclear. I think, you know, we talked about uh, true lies as a comp, which is an interesting comp. Well, and Bill um, brought up a really and, interesting point that like maybe it doesn't matter if the movie's enjoyable, but this sticks out. It's tough. Well, true lies, uh, you know, as we talked about, it, it, and Art Malik saw himself as like a pantomime villain, right? That film also is... Um, wildly over the top, and you know it, it, right. it's also a comedy to some extent. It's it's an action comedy. Um, this is very different. This is right. this is like very uh, serious. serious. Uh, there's there's not much humor in it. Um, it's ostensibly t- like drawing from real political events and geopolitical uh, concerns mm. um, to portray this character. And you know I'll, I can speak to this a little bit in in the sense, you know. I'm I'm married to a woman who of Middle Eastern descent. My in-laws are all uh, a, a Middle Eastern, and you know it's one of those things where, to be honest, as a kid watching these movies, I'm kind of like uh, it just you don't really think about it. But right. then suddenly you you uh, doing something like this, you're watching all of these movies, and you realize that the programming, the consistency oh, totally. of stereotyping, is very damaging, and you realize like that's probably a lot of people's only. Uh, the only filter through which they see any kind of Middle Eastern culture, which is so is is complicated, is diverse, is beautiful, is multiple religions and multiple countries, but in these movies they're often all just lumped into one generic mass uh, of uh, that person looks scary and they might blow me up. Well, even you know? more than that, it's like it speaks in a sort of platitudinal way, or platitudes of thinking about it. Like they're just bad people, right? Like they're terrorists and they want to blow up the West. And it's like it's it's not it's not reflective of of any kind of reality. Like it it, it dehumanizes it, right? And like these movies are for better or for worse propagandist propagandistic whether they whether it matters or not you know this movie kind of is the rejection from a hollywood filmmaking perspective of like the action of the let's kill let's get rid of the bozo action hero in favor of the thinking man but there's like no scene in the movie where kurt russell like you know there's no like equivocation. It's all just like, yeah, they're all terrorists. They're, like it, the, the movie doesn't have any nuanced perspective on, yes. on these issues. And I think some of that changes with what happens in history a few years after, but it gets way worse before it gets better yes. in terms of how we think about people from the Middle East and their, you know, in, in, in modern history. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, so yeah, that, that side of it, I don't think there was any way of, of, of ducking that. I think we have to yeah. tackle that kind of head on that, that aspect, despite, I think a, a, a pretty sophisticated, restrained and subtle performance yeah. from David Suchet as, as an actor, I think in ju- the, the, the portrayal, you know, broadly within is, is, uh, is a little, is a, is a bit ugly. There's one, there is one bit where one of the characters does say like, he made some comment about uh, this has got nothing to do with our religion or Allah or, or, or he says there is one character who set, who basically tries to, who? Um, I, it, it's a, one of the, it's one of the terrorists. Okay. They, argues against basically saying that David Suchet's character has gone too far because they had some oh, initial, you're right. the, yeah, I yeah, think yeah, they're yeah. trying this to, has nothing to do they're it, doing yeah. it to sort of just free somebody or something. Yeah. Right. Yes. But then, and then they, the other guys realize, hang on a minute, like you're actually going to, 
you know, crash this plane. It's like holy war type stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and he said, "That's not what we're we're doing. Here. That's got nothing to do with what our purpose is. It's the one. It's the one film's vague so weak to, with Allah, to right. have some kind of like balance. Yeah. Um. But you know, there's also it's also like you know, all people from the Middle East are also not uh of one religion. Right. You know. So it, it is just it's just a very reductive uh, portrayal. But. The one thing I will say in the film's defense on another point ar around that, around its um, like ethnic and racial portrayals, I do like the fact that the American group is uh, that are, are very diverse. Uh, it's diverse. Yeah. You, ha you have Halle Berry, you have B.D. Wong, you have Joe Morton, you have um, John Leguizamo. Mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 that was an element that I liked. And just speaking a little bit about Halle Berry as, uh, as the lady of this picture, she plays Jean... Boy, Halle the, Berry the is un, 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 unbeatable. She's so good in this movie. She's so believable. She's so sympathetic. It's she's great. She's yes, yeah, she's terrific. And and there isn't too much of a, um, a dimension to the character necessarily. But I think she brings a Those lot. Eyes. Just just her presence alone suggests like she just has like incredible screen. Well, she's also magnetism. kind of an every person as well, and she's sort of like takes the call to action from Kurt Russell and goes with it and is like really brave. I've, I've always, I, I really like her in this movie. I think she's, she's great. She is. She is great. And it's also interesting that, you know, she's done Joel Silver brought her into all of these films. I think whenever he could, and when often, she, oftentimes she rejected these movies. She was in last boy scout, her kind mm -hmm. of her breakout role, a Joel Silver movie. This is a Joel Silver uh, production, which I believe she turned down and he, he Paid her loads of money um, to to get her because he knew she was it's important a smaller to the part piece. too. So that's interesting. It, it, and then um, a Swordfish, uh, which is you know another um, yeah. you know that comes with <laughs> with an asterisk. Yeah. Uh, but you know, um, uh, I like Swordfish. That. I like that movie. That's but, funny. Yeah. Die Hard in a Bank? Question mark. Oh my god. Um, I, really quick, I have a friend who had an idea for a podcast called Talking About Swordfish, where he just pressed record and would talk about swordfish, <laughs> and then hit stop, and then hit record and just talk about it. And he was like, I'm going to do it every day for I've, a I've year. I've already subscribed. And see what happens. Yeah. So, you I know, think it was called Swordfish she, and the Swordfish or something. So, so she's, uh, yeah, she's she's um, great in this. Um, the action, the action uh, being one of our tenets of uh, the Anatomy of an Action movie, how would you rate the action well, real picture. quick, I want to jump back to the Halle Berry thing okay, for yeah, a second. Because the thing that I was talking about earlier with this movie is that when, I remember watching this movie with my dad and him being like, boy, if this movie were made when I was a kid and a white character went home with a black woman, there would have been riots. Gosh, like I, he had I, I this. Thought, it literally didn't occur to me. Yeah. And I know? remember him saying that. And he wasn't like, he was just like, he's, he, he moment, he mentioned this kind of like a moment of progress, right? Like he was like, it's like good to see this in a movie. Cause like when I was a kid, this wouldn't have been acceptable. Like, um, and so that's a weird, like, you know, it might seem obvious, but I, I think this was what, 1996. Six. We watched yep. the 96, 97. We're watching this movie together. So it's 27 years ago. And he was like, we're that close. He was like, if I'd watched this movie at your age, when I like, yeah, there would have been riots. People would have lost their minds seeing a white character, you know, court a black woman, which is an interesting sort of like reflection point when we talk about like how the Middle Eastern stereotypes are so bad in this movie, but the fact that it does that and doesn't feel significant, especially now, but to him, a 55-year-old man at that time, he was like, this is significant. Like this shows progress. And they presumably get to go to the hockey game after oh all. Oh, my God. Uh, I don't know. See, I feel uh, like the maybe... Capitals. It feels like there's, there's like maybe a debriefing that needs to go on <laughs> lately. No, fuck that. The, the, the puck drops in 20 minutes. Oh Let's God. go. <laughs> yeah, here's on Cloud Van Damme's going to be on the ice. Uh, the action is great. I actually think this is almost an anti-action movie. There's yes. not... There's the opening kind of raid on the... in uh, Where is that? It's in... Uh, uh, Chechnya, Chechnya. Boy, Something American like movies in the 90s love Chechnya as a place. Um, and... But then it's kind of just like a slow, stressful build to the final, which I really like. I like that this movie is mostly like battle suspense. of the wits, suspense. It's yeah. more of a suspense film than an action film. And when the action finally does happen, it's like pretty great and pretty contained. Um, I'm a little suspicious of the plane opening wide open and those passengers flying out and no one ever acknowledges oh, that yeah. that happens. Literally my biggest- like, Let's go my to the worst, hockey, a dead body falls on the My worst nightmare. 
Oh, I, a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I try not to yeah, try not the to idea think of being about sucked it. Sucked out of a plane. Oh gosh. Alive. Uh, Ooh, don't, don't. Oh, that got dark there for a yeah. second. <laughs> as long as Nicolas Cage is riding on my white tank top, I think it's fine. So right, I'll it. jump out and with the parachute. Too, yeah, exactly. You know. That's why um, I bring a parachute on every plane I go on. <laughs> Uh, Eve, that's even just as terrifying to He'll me as well, as, well, as well. I'm a big, despite my love for these movies. I'm a big scaredy cat. Yeah, um, it's true. Often there are people just that the, the movies do that Die Hard two thing, like you're saying, where like a b- bunch of people die horrifically, but it happened 20 minutes ago, yeah. so now we're happy. <laughs> yeah, no, it's cool. Does Halle Berry go home with Kurt Russell? Sweet. So. There is what I will say as well. I think the action in this, I agree. It's interesting because it sort of starts with like the structurally at one, all action, right? The the, the raid in Chechnya and then the incredible like um, sequence of merging with the plane to, to, to board it. That, that sequence is amazing. But then the meat of the movie, the second act is all cat and mouse suspense. Yeah. a, a A la Die Hard. Then you, but then it really again, a la Die Hard, opens up with these incre- this incredible sequence at the end in the third act, where the, where the uh, fighter jets are pursuing the seven forty seven and are ready to basically right. blow it out of the sky and the scale of that and that stuff. Oh man, the, that looks practical. Yeah, it does look practical. You know, and the, the Morse real, code is yeah. such a great. It's it brilliant. reminds me of uh, the scene in Red October. Ryan, one Ryan, ping only. Please. One ping. Oh, so good. <laughs> we got some macaroon. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, classic. But this movie, it, it does feel, to come to that point, it does feel like it's operating in the vein of like a B-minus Jack Ryan or like a summer book. It's like a it's like a, yes. a book you're reading on the beach airport in the novel, summer. Yeah, airport you know. novel. Great. Robert Ludlum kind of like post Tom Clancy, less techno jargon. Like this has way less. This is not a clear and present danger by any means, but it like it operates in like the less sophisticated version of I'll that. I'll tell you the, other, the, the, other, the other point I wanted to make about this, you know, I as some of you may may or may not know, but you know, my my uh, life is, is predominantly as a screenwriter working in the action genre, which is why I want to you know love these movies and want to talk about them. So a lot of that is a lot of that is involves research around um, military protocols and things like that. And what I really like about this movie is the way it's from my research about uh, special operators and Navy SEALs or Delta Force and whatnot. This term, I think about this a lot. There's the idea, like, for example, with the Bin Laden raid, that was supposed to happen the night before, but the weather was bad. Um, the conditions were awkward. And that's actually when uh, President Obama was doing the famous uh, White House correspondence dinner. So it was supposed speech. to happen the same night? It was supposed to happen the night before. I think wow. it happened on Sunday. It was supposed to happen on it the Saturday. It happened on Sunday because I remember they, I remember I was watching a Jean Pierre Melville movie. And it ended, and I walked out of the movie theater, and uh, I looked at my phone. So the, crazy. The, the, the point it, it was it was supposed to happen the day before. Everything was set for it to happen on that on the night before, but because the conditions weren't um, like adjusted the the calculus of the odds of the mission success slightly because of the weather conditions. They were like, let's actually, even though we're all geared up to do it, let's delay and do it the next day. And and the the term huh. from um, Admiral William McRaven, as I recall, w- was basically like, Mr. President, we're not going to rush to failure, right? That term, oh. rush to fa- like not to rush to failure, has become a bit of a credo in my life because often the instinct as we're impatient people and our lives are very fast and we have no attention spans now because we need the next reel on Instagram. And blah, right. blah, blah. Sorry, and I was often, looking at my often, phone. What'd you say? <laughs> exactly. Often we just want it done. Yeah. But these guys have to have actually a lot of the job, a lot of the psychology, a lot of the skill and discipline is not doing anything right. and waiting until the odds of mission success and the all which is is a c- composite of a bunch of different components uh lo- you know light timing strategic position uh, this how many happens men, in this movie when know. he's like let's 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 take the plane now Laguaziama's like let's take the plane yeah, now he, he's he and wants Russell's to go like, they don't know that we haven't gotten on board they don't know anything yet right and it's like there's suspense that builds out of that the fact that we know but the suits back in Washington. Another great movie with a bunch of people in a in a in a room trying to make decisions. You know, shades of Under Siege and Broken yes, Arrow. Yes, yes. So you, the, my point was just, I think that element yeah. of the film is actually very realistic, 
and very uh, interesting to me. But it's also, um, it, it's interesting as a, the audience experience because the audience wants the gratification of like, go in and go in and yeah. kill them, Let's right? Go. Yeah, the, yeah. You want the commandos to go in and this movie actually like gives you that possibility that it's going to happen. Then it pulls it back. But it's dramatic tension. So, so when, it, when it eventually happens, I think it's very satisfying. I will say, I think that the film is maybe like 10, 20 minutes a little too long, which I found, which is also the same problem with U.S. Marshals, mm. uh, Stuart Baird's second Weird, film. Weird, because he's an editor. Exactly. Mm. You would think if anybody understood that, like, keeping films, uh, especially in this genre, like two hours and under, uh, you know, is is pretty important. That said, I, w I don't know what necessarily you would cut, but it, have... it just feels a, just a tad too long. Let's um, take a uh, specially designed DARPA plane uh, to go to the what Die the Hard Oscars? Oh <laughs> my god! Well, I don't know. Um, that literally, there's a guy wearing a tuxedo in this movie, yeah. and you drop the ball well, there. Just put on your tuxedo, grab your martini. Oh god! And let's let's talk about the Die Hard Oscars. So, for our first category, the John McClane Yippie Ki Yay Award for Best Line, uh, I have three nominees. Give them to me. We're not gonna make it. You are. Oh, God. Great. Him seeing his little mannequin fly out of the plane is a very cathartic uh, event. It was. There is, it, there is, there's a sense of relief. <laughs> I'm sorry, isn't there? There's a sense of like, oh, I can breathe. Yeah. Oh, he's not choking the movie. Yeah. You he's, know. Um, I'm sorry. He's oh, bad. Like, yeah. It, it, and also his character is a prick. Yeah. Well, of course he's a prick. You know? He was a prick. It's um, funny how there's very few people that are universally regarded as just bad news yeah. like there are even some bad actors and i mean like yeah in hollywood now that like have had redemption arcs you know right. and maybe nominated yeah. for oscars yeah, 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 in the yeah, past yeah, yeah, seven yeah. or eight years and like they still don't seem as bad as this guy like it's crazy no one yeah yeah it's, it's, god yeah, it's, what a, it's wild ugh. it's wild yeah um so there's that one um hope there's a good movie on this flight I hate that fucking line. Meta. I gotta, yeah, I hate that line. <laughs> imagine, if they, hate... imagine if they were watching Executive Decision and it turns into like a Lynch film, like yeah, Lost that Highway. Would be, now that would be interesting. <laughs> the plane is showing Executive I, Decision. I like know that five we're trying to keep before. it short here, but can I just voice a? You, I, this is the Nikki Cat in Dark Knight effect that I describe it. I love the Dark Knight. I hate the character that Nikki Cat has to play in The Dark Knight. Because he's just there to deliver quips in right. like a scene that would otherwise be like pretty terrifying. It's one of the few moments in that movie where Nolan pulls a punch where I'm like, just let this be all right. engulf right. engulfing terror. Yes. We don't need the guy to be like, let's have some fun or whatever the hell. Like they say, I just hate those quips. I agree. I, I yeah. don't, I hate the wink at the camera. Lean into thing. the thing that you're doing with yeah. this. And like, I would say the dark night, that moment when they're driving the trucks and you see the car on fire in the distance and there's a like that, uh, Hans Zimmer forever, uh, that note. And, and then he cuts to him and he's like, uh Oh, looks like we're about to have a bad day. Like cut this shit from the movie. No offense to Nikki cat. I like, Nikki I Kat. love him Nikki as an Kat actor. As my Phenomenal. favorite line in insomnia. He goes, who has two thumbs and loves blowjobs? This guy. Like, I think he's great, but like. I love, I I, I could do a whole podcast about yeah. Nikki cat boiler room and way of the gun. Yeah. And, you oh, know, way of the like, gun. Um, amazing. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, 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 the third last line that I, I thought was pretty cool was, uh, Cappy played by Joe Morton says to Cahill, the Oliver Platt character, when they're trying to defuse the bomb, look at it this way. Like if you screw up, you'll never know it. Uh, that's the, that's the line. The I movie love there. that. I love their dynamic. I loved the, the humanity of that actually. Yeah. Cause it was sort of like, like in a weird way that takes the pressure off in a, in an odd way. Yeah. You know, because he, he I love their he can't relationship. Cut the wires and stuff. Yeah. Can't, it, it, I mean, it shows a way how in, this film is is quite int is quite adroit at being really really big yeah. and then really really small. Well, and they're just kind of trapped in a room together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go with that. Well, two great actors, like yeah. you, you know, that they can they can hold forty minutes of screen time just trying to defuse that bomb. Um, the Hans Gruber Exceptional Thief Award for stealing the Ooh, film. This, I'm curious because this a was a tough, yeah, this is a tough one. Category. Let's, let's we hear have Halle Berry mm. as Jean, John Leguizamo as Rat, John Joe Morton, excuse me, as Cappy, B D Wong as Louis, and Oliver Platt as Dennis Cahill. I'm gonna give it to Martha Maple Trump. From <laughs> 
I, I noticed that name, but I just suppressed it. Yeah. So because I'm like, She's I don't want to Google the non Mary Ellen trainer. Uh, yeah, I know. She's stewardess. the other the other yeah, flight yeah, attendant, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, flight attendant. Uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm Texas. In the words of Pong Joon Ho, I'm gonna Texas Chainsaw the award. Give half to John Leguizamo and give half to Oliver Platt. I think John Leguizamo is great in this movie. I think his character has an actual arc when he does the salute to Kurt Russell at the end. It's like hard earned and i think kurt russell's response just the very casual yeah the way he does that is cool but i think oliver platt is just unbeatable and and deserves more like he's great and his with his little jacket and his little swoop of hair and the little like toothpick he has in his mouth and is like he's practically screaming like i'm just an analyst the whole time and like i just love it i love an incongruous character and uh, he's just not a badass, and I like that. As yeah. the, as I, the I, I think that's spot on. The revenge of the nerds kind of thing. Yep. I like it. Yeah, no complaints. The Dick Thornburg Award for Dick of the Movie. Uh-huh. I have three nominees. Okay. Steven Seagal as Lieutenant Colonel Austin Travis. Now, that is not just continuing to put the boot on Steven Seagal as an actor. The actual character is a dick. Yeah, and it, but it's also hard. It's impo- It's indistinguishable. Yeah, you can't, you can't separate can't, the, can't two, separate. the two yeah, things. Yeah. But he's such an asshole. He's such an asshole. Um, and he eats eats it, and it's great when he eats but it. But I suppose at least he dies a noble death to some extent. Yeah, no, yeah, it's for sure. Um, JT Walsh in <gasps> the house. Me, 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 me. Mm. Travis Woods, this one's for you, bud. As Senator Jason Mavros, um, and then all, but also Will Schaub as the assistant to Senator oh, Mavros, that guy blows. who puts the idea in his head, like, "Hey, maybe there's a political opportunity." For Shades you here. of the Patriot Games uh, guy who's watching the raid on the camp, who like makes shitty comments. He reminds right, me of that. Right. But and also that Shades of Ellis and JT Walsh Love in Die that. Hard. Yeah. yeah, the guy who thinks he can negotiate, so, yeah. but is at way in over his yeah, head. Yeah, and also is not That's doing it for great, altru- altruistic reasons. He's doing it. And point. what happens to him immediately? He gets fucking blown away because they're like, you know, if if Kurt Russell had been on the phone with him, he'd be like, do not try to negotiate with these people. You yep. don't know who these people are. Absolutely. That's such a great point. And often I've wondered, I've, I felt like, what would the Ellis Award be? You know, but certainly if there it's, was one. I think one, it's not in every movie, but it would be in this movie. In this one, right? he gets the Ellis Award for, for it'd be like super complicated, like yeah. for trying to negotiate with terrorists when he probably shouldn't. Yeah, and doing um, too much cocaine. <laughs> I was just um, making a call. Yeah. <laughs> Miss some. Uh, <laughs> best Death, presented by... Okay, I'm going to try to do this as David Suchet in this movie. Wow. Elaborate. No more table. Next time you have a chance to kill someone, don't hesitate. Sort of underplay. Going for the the underplay. underplay. I saw David Suchet on stage in uh, Terrence Rattigan. Ooh. Play. He's a, you know cuz also in England he's a huge I got to go to more plays. Um, what play? I believe it I believe it was Man and Boy. I okay. I don't something? know that one. I don't Terence that right again I, I know. I think it was a lesser known one. But you know his stage work is legendary. Yeah, of course. In in the UK. Um He's still he's still alive. Still. I believe so. I believe he is, yeah. Yeah. Um so uh, the the best death nominees are indeed David David Suchet mm. um uh, JT Walsh, who gets the Ellis. Abs- You're so right yeah. about the Ellis thing now that I think about it. Gets the JT Walsh always playing the guy that's like a big fucking authoritarian heavy, and then turns out to be an absolute coward when yeah. the when the when what the heat is turned actor. up on him. Fucking amazing. What a great breakdown. Um, it's, it's die hard on a truck, I think. Uh, and then Steven Seagal. Um, yeah, that's it. That's it, right? Well, it that's an, that's an, like, an important death in action movie history. And both, it's both symbolically important and creative and inventive within yeah, the context. Kind of, of a, if that happened now, it would be like we'd be hearing about it. It'd be like think pieces. Let's about just it. talk about just for a second of not. You talked about the symbolism of what the character represents, the the fact that Seagal dies. But this idea of killing off what what at the time was a major movie star in the action genre, like and having the, having them be killed off that early in the film was a huge deal. Yeah. Like, it's like the, Shades of Psycho it, killing Janet yes, Lee. Yes, yes, that's exactly, psycho. exactly right. Which I guess would be the the, the, the progenitor. Well, it's the ur text of, of that right. idea, right? Because that was shocking because nobody knew. Everyone thought it was like a Janet Lee movie, I think, right? I'm trying to think of other films that maybe done that type of switcheroo. I mean, Alien, to some extent, there's a, the element yeah. of it's obviously an ensemble and people thought that, that you know, the, the, the more well-known actors like, 
Tom Skerritt or right. uh, or Harry Dean Stanton or Yafit Koto or oh, Ian Holm or yeah. John Hurt. There's got to be more. I, I, it ends I didn't up being really Sigourney, who's an unknown, is actually the hero. Think about heroine. that. But there's got to be there's got to be more examples. Of but it's that. just it just it, yeah worth worth it, within as we're talking about the best death category. I think it was a a, a real masterstroke. Yeah. Um, uh, well, it throws you off balance. Um, so uh, we will be back with our last section of the show, the Double Jeopardy trivia quiz, after this very quick break. We're back. We're back with the Double Jeopardy trivia quiz, where the scores can really change. Um, three quiz questions. You know, for I'm you. sitting. I'm thinking about my David Suchet mark on. I'm not happy with it. I just with have to get that. Yeah, I'm just not happy with it's how, pretty hot. I That's don't know. Tough. It's hard because he is he is a real underplay. What about like you know? a like a Leguizamo? Man, forget. Let's just move I think, on. I think we're heading into yeah. oblivion. Yeah, let's, <laughs> with the black the, hole. With that, work on it. Off, work yeah, on it next, work, for next yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the, the next movie? The Mission Impossible. Ooh, Henry Cerny. Next time you have a Henry chance to Cerny kill somebody. cast. <laughs> Can we revive that? Oh my god! Along with my iguana cast. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> uh, for all the uh, Robert you Davian survived. license to kill heads. Right. Question number one. Executive decision screenwriting team, Jim and John Thomas, also wrote which John McTiernan movie? Predator. Is correct. Mm. Which, like executive decision, focused on a group of colorful commandos. No free ads, but the guys over at Unclear and Present Danger covered this movie recently, and they had an interesting theory about the absence of the character and the politics, sort of, of the absence of the president, excuse yeah. me, and the Jim and the Johnson, the Thompson yeah. brothers, sort of what that might mean politically and, and whether it's a comment on Hill, on Bill Clinton, which is interesting. The I don't, un- I don't know, but the unknowability of it. It's interesting. Cause like in the rock, they do have the president. Cause I always the think the same of, guy who's in Armageddon. Yeah. I love that. And, and cause I'm often th- uh, for some reason the thought lit that, that line and the line delivery lives rent free in my head. Uh, strike approved. Ah, uh, it's you know. so fucking good. Um, we'll get there. But anyway, um, which Ayers. member? This is now. Th- th- that was a relatively easy one. Yeah, you're this really throwing one, softballs. I'm throwing a few softballs, but here comes my fastball. Oh God! The first assistant director <laughs> of the executive decision. This is this is coming in at ninety miles Let's an hour go. plus. Which member of the executive decision cast was once Kurt Russell's brother-in-law? Is this a major character? Uh, relatively. Um, I could gi- I'll give you a little clue without you having to call out. Um, he plays one of the commandos. Is it B.D. Wong? It is not. Is it John Leguizamo? It is not. Is it Whip? Whip? What's Are you going it? for strike three? Oh, oh. Whip uh, Hart- Hart- Hartley is his last name. Is it- so close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, it's it's Whip. Uh, I don't know whether it's Hubley or Whip- Hubley. Okay. I'm assuming Hubley. It's like our designer for the show, Tyson Hubley. Then maybe okay. they're maybe well, they're distantly yeah, related. We'll have to investigate that. Yeah, we'll shout to out Tyson. to shout, Tyson. let's give him a shout out. Ty, uh, Tyson's we love the best. Him. We love Tyson. He doesn't get enough credit. He makes all the assets on the show, makes the posters, makes the social media stuff. He's an unsung hero. Hire him. And he's related to potentially Whip Hubley. Whip, Whip Hubley, who the clue was going to be, of course, he played Hollywood in Top Gun. Um, oh my God, he did play Hollywood in Top Gun. He also is a good um, actor uh, in Species. So I've Whip, never um, seen Species. Whip. Whip, uh, Whip Hubley or Hubley. Whip Hubley plays uh, Sergeant First Class Baker, who the guy who does the Morse code, and he's the brother of actress Susan Hubley, who you may remember from Escape from New York as the girl in Choco, Chock Full of Nuts. Uh, she ends up getting like um, right. pulled to you her You know, death. I haven't seen Escape from New York since I was probably 12. Um, I haven't seen it since uh, yesterday. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't <surprise> me. <laughs> Five minutes ago. No, I need to. Re- it's a. It's a. I've seen it, but it's been so long. It shows on a repertory here every year. I should oh, just try to catch it. For me, of. it's like uh, yeah, top yeah, tier, uh, Philly special. It's, it's life. Final question, and I think you'll enjoy this one. All right, take your time, <laughs> okay. and please ask for the clue because I okay. work hard on the clue. <laughs> okay. What if I All right, don't? Final question. No, you have to. Okay, please. Well. The, the, the clue's the best part of this. Kurt Russell and J.T. Walsh appeared in a total of four films together. <gasps> fuck can you. you can oh, you name you. the other three? Oh, fuck you. Oh, fuck. Uh, no, give me that. Well, breakdown. All right, let me give you the clue. Just play the, Just play along. Give me the- <laughs> All right, here's Jump the clue. Off. Here's the clue. Here's the clue. <laughs> Delicious cocktail, Chicago fire, and car trouble. Okay, so breakdown, backdraft. Delicious cocktail, delicious cocktail. 
No. I don't know if you saw my my it was nineteen. Oh, Tequila Sunrise! Yay! I forgot G.T. Walsh was in that. So I was actually because of that. I I wanted. I I, I was really busy last night and watching uh, just, Tequila just, Sunrise. Just, got it. Yeah, <laughs> just, yeah. Well, well I, honey, I, I just backed up all night. I gotta watch Tequila <laughs> that Sunrise. That was my reward. I was I was busy parenting stuff and it was like really late. It was like it was like ten thirty. I was like finally had a chance to sit, sit down and I was like I, I don't have time to watch Executive Decision. But I just want to watch like twenty minutes or something. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And I was like. And then on my four disc Kurt Russell collection, oh I have God. Tequila Sunrise. So I was like, oh, let me just watch 20 minutes. How's of this. Mel in that one? It's been a long time. Mel plays the lovable coat dealer, the hero of the film, I which love- is absolutely wild. Man, right? I struggle so much the, with my the, Mel love. <laughs> I love Mel, but oh God. It, it, that book. That film, I tell you what, is like a a really like a languid Robert Town. Uh, it's Robert Town written directed, and directed it. yeah. And Kurt Russell's like uh, kind of a prick in it as the cop who's his friend who's That's out right. to bust him. Yeah. And Michelle Pfeiffer is in the middle of the love. Used triangle. to make things in this country, etc. Et I remember renting Raul that. Julia. It's a pretty horny movie, right? Yeah. yeah. It's, and it's Raul Julia. Raul Julia. And Holy it's shit. shot by Conrad uh, Conrad Hall. Oh my god. Gorgeous, yeah. Uh, like, and, and and inevitably, I was like, "Well, I've got a little grenadine in the fridge. Let me mm. make a tequila sunrise." Oh hell yeah, brother! So I had a tequila sunrise. Well, I was it was very on the nose, but I I uh, I had I had a good. That was can a good I tell you twenty five minutes of my life. I'm gonna I, watch the rest tonight. Uh, can I tell you what I did last night? I re- did some research for our Con Air episode because for you're obsessed. I'm with reading this. Madness and Civilization <laughs> by Foucault right now. I'm in a reading group, a Foucault reading wow, group right now wow. because that's I can't read the shit by my own. That's and how I, seriously I read we take 30 it. pages, which took two hours because I was constantly looking things up. And at the end, I was like, I don't know if I remember a single goddamn thing. Anyways, is that uh, it? Is there one that, more? That, that's is, it. that is our show for today, folks. Um, please, please. I don't know. Please. 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 (laughs) Rate, review, subscribe, follow the show. Tell your friends about the show. Uh, We do, we do fun little, I forgot to mention this before, but we occasionally do fun little uh, on Twitter, on X, um, little like polls. And uh, we recently, for our 12 Monkeys episode, which now is a month ago, so sorry, ran one about the great uh, Bruce Willis performances. And, mm. um, and uh, uh, the winner, I mean, we're, we're, we're just, we're on there, we're putting them out there, they're fun, it's a fun thing to do. Uh, follow follow me on X, I'm Liam G. Billingham, uh, the, the podcast is Die Hard OAB. Phil, you recently bought your second Cyber Truck, right? Yeah, the I'm, first stack, I'm, I'm stacking, packing, and racking. Yeah. Ala Fred Dalton Thompson. He sold and his Die house to buy more Cyber Trucks. <laughs> so that's, he's building a but Cyber Truck. Army. I am on Twitter, and I actually occasionally tweet something little, that that we might both go have had some somewhat viral, viral. Some viral stuff. Viral lately. film Twitter bants. Yeah, we so, love it. You know, yeah, get involved. Um, you know, and uh, and if you have questions, you know, things you want to ask us about, we're diehardoab at gmail com listen to our recent episode of 50 miles per hour the speed oral history podcast uh you know there's also if you go to our website diehard on a blank.com you can listen to phil guest on eye of the duck oh yeah you can listen to me talk about starship troopers on we cows both did in the eye field of the duck, uh, both total did recall total recall eye of the duck we love those guys shout out um, to uh, adam and dom you know if you want us on your podcast like we're a veil we like to do podcasts so please reach out um next next time on the show next time on the show it's a obscure little mumblecore movie called mission impossible Ooh, ba, 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 all i'm gonna ba, say ba, is this ba, boo. all i'm gonna say is this Beedy boo. Beedy ethan boo. hunt wears a white tank top that's all i'm gonna say that's all i'm gonna say the rest that's- you'll have to tune in for all those diehard connections Uh, We'll be back next time when you haven't seen me very upset. Die Hard on a Blank is a podcast created and hosted by Philip Gawthorn. Liam Billingham co-hosts and produces the show. Mike Mayer and Michael Sugar are the executive producers. Find us on Twitter and Instagram at Die Hard OAB. Rate, review, follow the show wherever you get your podcasts. Most importantly, tell your movie podcast loving friends about Die Hard on a Blank. See you next time on Die Hard on a Blank. <laughs>